Hello and welcome back to One on One, New York's longest running sports call-in show. Along with Thomas Aiello, I'm Colin Lochran, and we're thrilled to be joined by the New York Post Knicks beat writer, Mark Berman. Mark, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, uh, Thomas and Colin. Thanks so much for inviting me on. It's great to have you. And, you know, of course, the Knicks season has been over for quite a while, but that hasn't stopped them from making some headlines. Recently, it was reported that they're hiring Jalen Brunson's father, Rick, as an assistant coach. I have to ask, with Jalen entering free agency, should Knicks fans feel somewhat more confident about potentially having him come to the Big Apple? I'll be honest, I wouldn't read that much into it. Uh, you know, we've been writing about Rick Brunson uh, joining Tom uh, for a while, uh, back even a couple of years ago. So this has been in the works. And Rick has told people that he didn't want to join the Knicks staff until his son uh, got his big contract because his first four years, he was making minimum wage. Whether this convinces Jalen to play for the Knicks, I'm not sure. I mean, they've had a very complicated relationship. I mean, they're very close, but Rick Brunson has been so hard on his son across the years. He's really guided his basketball career very hands-on. And I wonder if he'd want to actually be in an organization where he'd be traveling with his father. I mean, maybe. I don't know. I just, I just know that Tom Thibodeau is delighted to have his former assistant coach, uh, Rick Brunson, on his staff. Had him in Chicago, had him in Minnesota, was an assistant coach with the Knicks when Rick was there. They go way back. So, you know, Tom Thibodeau has not always had his choice of assistant coaches. William Wesley uh, who's one of the senior executives, hired Johnny Bryan as an assistant coach. He hired Mike Woodson, and he hired Kenny Payne. And Tom Thibodeau really didn't know those guys. So it's a good move for Tom. Fingers crossed that Jalen wants to be around his father quite a bit. So, Mark, sticking on the topic of the Knicks, of course, Tom Thibodeau and the team this year, they took a step back from the season prior, of course, making the playoffs. This year they're going... 37 and 45, they're back in the draft lottery. And there's a lot of uh, mishmash talk about what they're going to do with pick 11. Are they going to trade up? Are they going to get rid of the pick completely for a star player? Who's on the roster now that's going to move? What in your, in your perspective and your mind could be a realistic draft day scenario for the Knicks as we approach uh, that special night? Yeah, I think everything's on the table, uh, including trading it all together. If they could get like a real solid player uh, for the rotation, like a starter, a solid starter. But more realistically, they love Jaden Ivey. I've heard that for months. They were able, as I reported, to interview him in Chicago, even though he's out of the, their range. But he's, he's a, a CAA guy. So Leon Rose has all those connections and, and maybe they'll even work Jaden out moving up. They probably have to get up to five, maybe even four. I mean, there's even talk about the Rockets liking him at three, but I think that's a smoke screen, but yeah, they love Ivory as a combo guard. He's the type of guard that, you know, he gets in the lane and he draws double teams and starts the offense that way. That's what the Knicks are looking for. Kemba Walker was not that player and Derek Rose was injured almost the whole year. They need a, a, a point guard that could get into the lane and, and draw attention and pass it out to open shooters. Uh, you know, Alec Burks is obviously not that type of point guard. In the 11 range, there's some really good players. Uh, Johnny Davis is a good two-way shooting guard. He's got improved from three-point range, and he's looking good in some workouts. And then there's that uh, Jeremy Sohan from Baylor, who's a terrific defender. But the biggest guy that's popped on the radar screen is that Dyson Daniels who played in the G league ignite skipped college. And he's a six, eight point guard. I mean, some people don't see him as a point guard, but the G league ignite coaching staff made him the point guard showed. He can pass showed. He can ball handle it needs to be a little better, but he's a very good defender and he's got to improve his three point shooting. But if Dyson Daniels could fall to 11, you know, I think the Knicks would be very happy. As Thomas alluded to, the last two years or so for the Knicks have really been quite the journey. I'm wondering, as someone who's followed the team closely, what can you say regarding the job Coach Tom Thibodeau has done during his Knicks tenure? 
Listen, he won coach of the year and he, he probably didn't deserve it over Monty Williams that particular season, but he, he edged out Monty because that roster was, was fairly mediocre. Listen, they went into that season with Las Vegas predicting them for like 22 victories. So they really overachieved. He got Julius Randle to play way over his head. And he got RJ going on, a, on the right track. And he got a great season from Derek Rose after Tom, you know, urged management to trade for him. So his first season was spectacular. But then the, all the flack he took for his second season, when the team kind of came back to earth, I think it really showed that they played over their heads and overachieved in that first year. And I don't think he deserved all that criticism Although I would have liked to see him be a little less stubborn. Uh, I think he gave Randall too much leash. I think he needed to hold Randall accountable more. And I think he could have, Obi, that his teammates love him. And I know Tom was concerned about his defense, his team defense, but he, he brings a spirit to the club. And down the stretch of the season, Tom finally got one over. Uh, it was a little too late, but he got won over by Obi Toppin's intangibles. That when he's on the court, everyone seems to pick up their game, pick up their spirit. They run the floor better. They pass more. With Julius Randle, the team sort of bogged down. And that's the big issue now that Tom Thibodeau has to figure out. If they don't make a trade with Randle, how do you play Randle and Obi Toppin together? as they're both power forwards, they're not very versatile. Neither is a five and neither is a three. So that's the big challenge. Do they go four and five small ball? Tom doesn't like that defensively. It's a tough challenge, but Tom is very stubborn. And that's what ticked off a lot of fans. And he would not play more of the younger players like Miles McBride. That baffled me. Good defender, point guard, good distributor. He had a team first mentality. But he didn't get any minutes. He wanted Alec Burks on the court, and it frustrated the fan base, and it frustrated me. So you bring up, Mark, the older players playing over the younger players, and I wanted to hit on this because this is something that a lot of Nick fans on social media and ones that I've talked to in real life have kind of uh, thought of. Do you think that in order for the Knicks to get better and for Tom Thibodeau to to really play these younger players that the Knicks are giving him, right? Do you think that they have to be forced, like forcibly taken away from him, almost as if a, you're taking candy away from a baby? I know that, that that's an insane analogy to use, but could that be a possibility for this team with guys like Randall, Alec Burks, Evan Fournier, uh, maybe Taj Gibson, I guess, could be in that mix? Do you think that's a possibility? And do you think that would create a lot of uh, friction between Rose and Thibodeau? You make a good point. Uh, yeah, I think the Knicks would like to trade Alec Burks uh, and get a, a young asset, even if it's draft picks, even if it's a trade exception, just so Thibodeau doesn't dare play him at point guard again next season. Uh, yeah, Taj Gibson, he loves, but after the All-Star break, he agreed with management. I don't know if he did it, how reluctantly he did it, but he played the rookie center Jericho Sims after the All-Star break and they got a good look at him and they got a good impression that he could be a rotation player in this league. So, yeah, he has to be forced into it a little bit and maybe you got to trade a Burks, even trade a Derrick Rose. Uh, but Tom loves his veterans and, you know, he knew he had to save his job though. And because as we reported at the All-Star break, there were at least two front office members who thought Tom had lost the team and thought he should be fired. And that could still happen if the Knicks get off to a lousy start this season. There's a lot of speculation that Johnny Bryant, the assistant coach, is being groomed as Tom Thibodeau's successor. He's a young assistant uh, that the Jazz had for many years and obviously knows Donovan Mitchell very well. So, uh, that could be a drawing card if Johnny Bryan ever became the head coach. The Knicks might unfortunately be out of it, but there's still NBA finals games to be played. 
the Golden State Warriors and Boston Celtics, of course, gave us a great game one matchup with the C's taking home the W. I'm wondering, did you see anything in game one that surprised you? I mean, I counted the Celtics out. Uh, it was the fourth I did quarter, too. double digits. I was ready to go to sleep. But uh, I think Draymond Green made a little comment, like, you know, they went, like, whatever, 19 for 24 from three-point range. We're, we're pretty sure that's not going to happen again. Well, that was his uh, in insinuation. But this is a savvy team that has nine lives, best team since January in the league. Most scouts will agree. They don't give up. They have a lot of heart, even though they had no finals experience. Al Harford is just a, a grimy veteran who you just, you know, he's a winner. And he won a national championship, at least one at Florida. So, you know, th there are some winning players. I think Jason Tatum is a winning player and Jalen Brown is a winning player, even though they never got all the way to the finals. Uh, so, yeah, it was surprising to see Boston light it up for the three-point range in that fourth quarter on the road. Uh, and kind of after the first quarter, Curry wasn't spectacular. I, I just – Boston just continues to amaze me. And to steal one in San Francisco was huge because I'm telling you, San Francisco is a loud arena. It's one of the loudest in the league. Boston is arguably the loudest arena in the NBA in the playoffs. They have great fans and a great tradition, and now they're going to have home court advantage. And they have a lot of heart. And Emmy, the Odoka, who interviewed for the Knicks job once, uh, should have won Coach of the Year in retrospect, obviously, with Monty Williams right now golfing. So, Mark, I want to touch on some more NBA final stuff, but in terms of the media, obviously there's no Mike Breen, there's no Jeff Van Gundy due to COVID. So it's Mark Jones and Mark Jackson running the show for the time being. Do you think that there's a little bit of a different feel maybe to how these finals are being called? Or do you think that Mark Jones is doing as good of a job and or almost in the way that Breen would do the job that he's been doing for the last 20 something years? Do you think that there's a little change in there or no? I do. Uh, I even set, felt it in game seven of Miami Boston when Mike Breen was out with COVID also. Jeff was there, but Jeff had a, and I wrote this about, a, you know, Jeff had a sore throat. Uh, you could hear his horse throat and Mike wasn't there. And Mark Jackson just didn't seem that excited for a game seven. I'll be honest. It seemed like he was going through the motions. So uh, last night, yeah, it just didn't have the gravitas that an NBA finals should have uh, without Mike Breen and Jeff Van Gundy. I think, I think that the problem is, that uh, there's such a great chemistry between Mike, Jeff, and Mark that even though, you know, the substitutes are okay, uh, they just don't have that same humor and that same back and forth. And I missed it. And it's, it's been, this would have been their 14th season doing it. Let's hope that Mike is back. He's had COVID now for over a week. Uh, Jeff may be out game two. Sunday, but I would love to see those three guys together again, at least when they go back to Boston. We're certainly hoping they get back soon as well. They've, of course, been the soundtrack for this playoffs in a lot of ways. And, you know, one of the big storylines has been the Celtics defense. They've consistently stifled teams' offensive production every step of the way. Do you think a team like that could be successful? in the 80s and 90s style ball when proactive defense was more common? Right. They're sort of a throwback team right now. You know, this is supposedly the three-point era. But now the Celtics are, you know, starting this trend. And we heard it at the Chicago Combine where all these prospects were kind of talking about how they're versatile defenders and they can switch one to five. They could guard all five positions. That's like the new vote term because that's what Boston does. They switch on every pick and roll because they have players like Marcus Smart who could guard centers. Like if you remember years ago when Przingis was on the Knicks, that was a big uh, problem area. Przingis was always stifled by Marcus Smart, somehow getting under him and, and giving him a, a tough physical battle. And now Marcus won defensive player of the year and he's leading this Celtics defense along with Hawford 
but Jalen Brown is a terrific defender. Tatum is an underrated defender. Right down the line, Grant Williams, obviously, a solid defender. Yes, defense is ruling the roost. Miami also makes the conference finals. And everyone talked about the three-point revolution, and there's been books written about it. But Boston's defense has stolen the show uh, during this spring run to the championship round. So staying on the topic of Boston, they were a team at the beginning of the year that, and I, I'm going to humiliate myself for this, I had written them off, not even getting in the playoff or the play-in tournament, excuse me. And now here they are in the NBA Finals. W- what do you think at any point in the season was the, the moment where Boston management and the coaches and the players said, we've got, we're going to flip it right now. Where do you think that started? Maybe when the Knicks beat them three times. I think the <laughs> Knicks were three and one. Fournier played out of his mind. It was one night Kemba came and rescued the Knicks. Uh, and then opening night, double overtime victory and a thriller. And yeah, so the Celtics are coming off a, a mediocre season uh, last year where they were knocked down in the f- first round by, uh, by the Nets. And the first thing about it one year ago, Brad Stevens was promoted to president, and I think the next day he traded Kemba Walker, attached an asset, got back Al Hofford, who people thought may have been over the hill, and they decided not to re-sign Evan Fournier, and that worked out. Uh, So, But in the middle of the season, Udoka finally really got the defensive message across to them. Uh, They were, you know, two games under 500 at some point in uh, December. Uh, so things finally clicked. They finally bought into the rookie coach's message. And he's been a terrific. Uh, listen, Odo, Odoka was also an assistant with the Nets and interviewed with the Knicks. So that either both teams could have had him as their head coach. He's become a terrific head coach. And the Celtics, listen, one scout said if the Celtics win the title, it's the worst Celtics team to ever win the championship. But they'll take it. They'll take number 18. Definitely interesting in Boston with everything that's happened this year. The Western side of things in this finals is also fascinating because with this season's appearance, the Warriors have now made six finals in the last eight years. It begs the question, Mark, does Golden State have a claim to being one of the NBA's greatest dynasties? Yeah, I mean, it's a dynasty now uh, to go two years uh, without making the playoffs and then back in the finals after that tremendous run. And to do it with Durant, without Durant, uh, it's it's really a, a great dynasty that Steve Kerr has put together. One of the greatest. I mean, it's probably a top five. Uh, let's see how they fare now. I mean, if they win the championship, we might be talking a little loftier uh, in the in the greatest teams of all time. But the three mainstays, Clay Thompson, Draymond, Gr- Draymond Green, and Steph Curry, are are still there, even though Clay Tom. Thompson is a little diminished. I mean, he's just not the same star that he was when they were winning the titles. Even defensively, scouts say he's just not, doesn't have the same pep and bounce after all those knee surgeries. But, you know, he's still solid and still can shoot from three. Uh, Steve Kerr is a wonderful coach. Again, I hate to bring up the Knicks name again, but he had verbally agreed to be the head coach of the New York Knicks with Phil Jackson. But then he met with the Warriors after the Warriors got bounced in the first round and they fired Mark Jackson immediately. And he met with ownership and just loved his time with hanging out with the new Warriors owners. And he realized Dolan's reputation and he asked his buddy Phil Jackson if he could renege on his verbal agreement. And Phil Jackson, you know, it's debatable what Phil should have done, but he says, Steve, go with where your heart takes you. And the rest is history. The rest is a dynasty created by Steve Kerr's magical touch. He's a great guy and a great coach. I want to switch over back to the NBA draft a little bit. Of course, we talk about the huge names like Ivy and Van Caro and Chet Holmgren and this one and that one. But I want to switch to those second round later picks because some p- good players can come out of there, role players, maybe even an all-star if you get lucky, maybe even MVPs if you get really, really lucky like the Nuggets do. 
Who do you like in that very late area of the draft this year for any team in the NBA? Give me two guys that you really like. Well, the um, the Knicks, I guess they picked 41 or 42. I can't remember which one. And there is a Gonzaga sharpshooter uh, uh, that I saw at the Chicago Combine. It might be H- Holmberg. Oh, Ryan uh, Nemhard. Oh, Nemhard. Yeah, that's his name. Yeah, I saw him. Great shooter. Uh, and I feel the Knicks need shooting. And he hasn't worked out yet, but I think he will. And keep an eye on that on that name. Uh, you know, the Knicks have had a few guys we've talked to recently uh, in the last few days go through Tarrytown, including a local kid, uh, Tyson Etienne from Wichita State, probably pronounced his name wrong, but his father played at uh, Maryland. His God's father is Marcus Camby. And he's a point guard who may have fallen off. I think if he w- came out last year, he would have been a early second round pick, but he decided to stay in the draft. And now he's more later second round, but I know the Knicks like him. Uh, and then there's uh, Orlando uh, Johnson from Fresno State, 6'11", versatile defender. We got a chance to talk to him in Tarrytown. Uh, another player to keep your eye on. The Knicks love, want to become more versatile defensively. I wrote that Thibodeau doesn't like to switch that much with this team because he didn't feel the roster was capable of. He didn't want to switch with Mitchell Robinson because he liked Mitchell guarding the interior. Uh, he didn't want him out on the perimeter guarding a, a, a six foot two player because it was kind of wasting him. So, but they would like more versatile defenders and maybe they could add one in the second round. Just one final question for you, and it has something to do with the shape or structure of the association. Recently, NBA commissioner Adam Silver said that he's not completely against changing the format or shortening the season if it would reduce injuries. Would you say that shortening the season is a solid idea or something the NBA should look into? Oh, 100 percent. 82 games and then this ridiculous two month postseason that has dragged on and on and on. The play-in situation is bogus. There's no way that it should be that lengthy and that complicated and that involved. If you want to add a little spice, do the eight, nine teams, have them have a best of a one game playoff and the ninth seed has, has to win two games. But the way he's structured it, with the seven through 10 is just a nightmare. The fans I feel have tired out. It's been the the regular season ended two months ago, April 10th. There's no way that a postseason should last over two months, which it has uh, gone. We'll, We'll go over two months once they get into the middle of the finals. So shorten the regular season to 70 games. I'd love to see that and get rid of the play and stuff. And I think we have a more attractive product. Naturally, it's all about revenue with Adam Silver milking every single dollar he can milk so these players can make $200 million contracts and not even be a superstar. So that's what it's about. It's about revenue. It's about the TV deals, wanting more games, more commercials, uh, more money. But for the fans... I think some fans are tuckered out. I mean, I just, I mean, we're, it was a great game one, but going into the finals, I didn't feel the same buzz that I usually feel going into the NBA finals. Uh, and I think it's because of the endless postseason. Mark, thank you so much for joining us on the show. We appreciate the time very much. Everyone stay tuned to one-on-one New York's longest running sports call-in show.